Hello everyone. I'm going to go ahead and start a quick, well this one's not going to be quick, sorry, this is going to be a rather long video most likely because we're going to be going from the very beginning to the very end when it comes to rendering our scene and hopefully the applications will behave. I've had a lot of problems with Cinema 4D, uh, especially as of late, I don't know why, but it seems like every time I try to do some rendering it force crashes and uh, I can't recover from that so hopefully that won't be a problem with us today but we will be using Gaia Cinema 4D and Corona Renderer so if you want to follow along you most certainly can um, if you're not using Corona use whatever render engine that you're using um, and hopefully it'll be similar but there are going to be some stuff that I, I'm going to be using specifically to Corona so let's go ahead and uh, show you what we'll be making. So this is what we'll be making, or something similar. It's not going to be exactly like this. It'll be it'll be similar to this. Um, and what we have here is the landscape, which was made in Gaia and an HDRI and these plants. So nothing else except for the plants and the sky was made with any with other programs. Uh, let me reword that. Sorry. The landscape and these rocks were all made in Gaia. Um, the plants are mega scan plants. The HDRI is, a, is one that I have that I took and created myself. Um, and this was made in Cinema 4D using Corona. Um, and I have another version of it right here. Um, this was a test render. This wasn't one that I finished. Um, but I put a little tree in there. I put some dust in the air. It's really hard to see. It's a very minor dust effect, um, but it didn't quite clean up and there's fireflies everywhere. So I, I didn't keep it. Um, I changed it around a little bit, but again, these rocks and this landscape, they were all made in Gaia. And then the plants themselves are from Megascan. So we're, we're going to be using Megascan bridge as well. Um, and this, these landscapes right here are, just this one repeated for the background. Okay, so now that I've showed you what we'll be doing, let's go ahead and get into Gaia. I know that was kind of a long uh, intro there, but I had to make the point. So we will be doing a blank scene. And now this is a very simple landscape to build. It, it doesn't take a whole lot, and there's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, the main ingredients here are rocky, the rocky node and insert however what we're going to be using is um, a landscape to help form the base first so um, you can use whatever primitive you want or even whatever look dev you want um, and there might be some experimentation that goes on in this video as well I'll try to keep it more straightforward and and whatnot but the, there might be some experimentation so you can start with slump, uh, and you can start with, like I said, you can start with any of these uh, if you want. And I am using Gaia 1, 3, what was it, 1, 3, 0, 4, I believe is what the latest bleeding edge is. Let me see real quick. I don't have it dedicated to memory for some reason. I should. Yeah, 1, 3, 0, 4. So that's the latest uh, bleeding edge version of Gaia. Um, and you will need at least the 1.3 line of uh, Gaia Bleeding Edge for these nodes and for this build to work properly. So keep that in mind as well. So yeah, again, you can use Slump, um, Multifractal you can use, and I usually just like to right click in here and type it in. Multifractal is a good one as well. And the, the one that I showed you earlier, um, that was made with multifractal so i'll stick with that but slump does a pretty good job at creating these hills and whatnot that allow um some uh hillish smooth hill looks that the rocks can rest on so i just wanted to throw that out there just so you guys can can use slump as well if you wanted to follow along follow along but not go exactly step for step here um like I said, I used multifractal in that example I showed you, and I'm going to stick with it in this one. And the reason why I like using multifractal 
is because it it has a lot of good detail potential, but it also allows you to create very smooth, flowy patterns that is easier to get than using Perlin, uh, or even Voronoi for that matter. So to better show this, I'm going to stick with the FBM style, though you could use Billowy. Billowy actually might make more sense because that is more of a hill style look. Um, so you know what, maybe maybe I'll stick with Billowy for this one. The other one I used FBM, but we'll try Billowy on this one. You can then increase the feature scale, uh, or the large scale size, sorry, not the feature scale. And when you increase that, uh, we'll attempt here, the uh, large scale noise that makes up the multifractal will obviously get larger. And if you keep an eye on these larger features as I reduce the large scale uh, size, it's, it's going to probably have an issue here. Those features get smaller and smaller. So um, I like to have really uh, large features for this specific build because it gives us a lot of, um, it, it doesn't give us a whole lot of detail that will take away from the rocks, but it also makes it a lot easier for the insert node to do what it needs to do. Next is the feature size, and that'll be the smaller, um, more detailed features. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, it'll be like the smaller detail features uh, that make up the, that are part of the large scale size, but the feature size themselves are like these areas right here. These look like they're rocky almost as well. When you increase the feature size, these will reduce. And then if you decrease it, they will uh, become a little bit more stark, as you can see. Um, again, I want something a little bit more flat, so I'm going to increase that. I, I want to keep a little bit of detail in there, but I don't need a whole lot uh, because the rest of the detail that we're going to get is going to come from the Rocky node. Um, roughness is where we're actually going to get the majority of our smoothness. If you increase roughness, obviously the landscape gets more rough. If you decrease it, it gets more smooth. So we don't want it this smooth. We need some features and some detail in there for everything else to work properly. So we're just going to increase this until we get some details popping in. And again, we don't want um, as many as uh, this much because this is just a little bit too much. And we just got to reduce it a little bit. So I think 45 was pretty good. That's 5% less than default. Everything else you don't have to worry about. You can. You can play with the seed a bit, uh, you can play with the variation, but um, it's not. these aren't really going to make too much of a difference and in some cases can actually break it. So uh, if at this point, if you found the right roughness, large scale size and feature size, everything else is okay. Just play with the seed until you find what you like. Um, and if I can find one here to show you guys while I'm clicking through these, while I'm trying to explain this, I'll just stop and show you. But what you're looking for is something that's more like a slope. Um, that one's a little bit too flat, uh, more like a slope, but doesn't cut off, uh, extreme on the edges. So like right here, if there was a, um, like a big spike on the edge, because there's like a feature set that's coming in, you don't want something like that. You want one more like this, where there's a bit of a gradient, like a slope, but the edges don't really, um, peak really high off the edge or really low off the edge. So this one right here is actually quite nice because it's it's a, a gradient, a nice slope, and it's not very extreme. And we have all these nice little details in there as well. Um, so I actually like this one quite a bit. So we're going to stick with that. <clears throat> um, at this point, we want to probably add some effects, uh, some filters, erosion, or something like that to help kind of change this around, make it more interesting, but you don't have to. Um, again, this is a very simple build. You can stick with just this and then do an insert node almost immediately. So we'll take that, put it into input one, and then the, the way the insert node works is that it will take input uh, one as the base and then insert the input to here, which is actually the insert option. Um, and that will insert that second input on top of your first input. And then you can play with the, the blending and that uh, insertion that it does. So let's go ahead and get the Rocky node up. 
and the type of rocks that we want to use is important. We don't want to be using just this regular pattern here. Um, we want to break it up. Um, so you want to use the clusters here. And the reason why is because we want to have sporadic rock. We don't, if you want big cr clusters, then by all means play around with the large and small clusters here. But shattered is what I used and worked really well. And the reason why I like that is because it kind of just scatters these rocks all over the place. Um, and that creates more of a field with lots of rocks in it, something that you would find probably in Iceland or, uh, or the plains of the Midwest, uh, uh, or even, um, or just the West of the United States. We have big swaths of plains that just have big boulders in them. And this is kind of akin to that. So let's go ahead and put this together. And as you can see here, by default, the insert node already does a pretty good job at placing in those rocks on top of our first fractal. And as you can see there, our multi-fractal. And it's just inserting them. It's not changing the underlying fractal. It's just taking what we have here and plopping it on top of the multi-fractal. Now, that's not the same as combining. So if we take a, com a combine node here, and we take this input, and then we do the second input there. As you can see here with the regular blend node, we're already changing our landscape quite a bit, but in this kind of specific um, situation, the blend wouldn't be what you would want. You would want something similar to max, um, and then you'd have to play with the ratio to find what you want, but since the rocky node is really flat, you're not gonna see it come in anywhere. The other one would be add, and um, as you can see here, add does a pretty good job as well, but we're going to use the insert node and then we're going to go ahead and show you why we're going to use the insert node. Um, add does the same thing as like the, the same effect as insert. So uh, you can get similar results that way if you would, if you wanted, but the insert node has other settings that we're going to use. And you can see here, even, with um, the combined node, it's still slightly different. But if you didn't want to use the insert node for whatever reason, you could definitely use combine and use the add option. Um, but here is what we're going to do. The insert node has three options. There's a threshold, flatten, and extend. Um, the threshold, when you play around with the threshold, you're going, if you keep an eye on like the rock areas over here, this is going to bring in your first input. Uh, a bit more uh, from what I could tell. I could be wrong on that, um, but it's the, the threshold changes uh, between the two uh, inputs that you have here. And um, the higher the threshold, the more you're gonna get the threshold for the first input. However, if you do that, when it comes to your boundary for your rocks or whatever your second insert, uh, your node is for the insert input is, you're going to lose more boundary. So you want to have just enough threshold where you're getting, depending on your specific landscape, that you're getting enough of your insert node. This one, this is what I'm gonna consider the insert node um, because it goes into the insert slot to come through without the threshold being too high because if the threshold's too high, we're going to lose much of what we have for the boundary. And I'll show you that right here. I'll just apply a auto level. And we'll just view that as a mask. There we go. Now, um, when we go back to the insert node, we'll pin this one with F. Uh, you click on the node, hit F on the keyboard, that'll pin it, or you can just right click it and go to pin. Now, if we increase the threshold, as you can see, we're getting less of that boundary. Uh, so we're not going to get a good mask for our features with the insert node. We want to keep the threshold low. That way, um, it's really having a hard time with this multi-fractal. You want to keep the threshold low. And so when it comes to texturing and using this as a mask for other things outside of Gaia, you have a good mask to work with. So I like to go really low um, with this specific build. You can go as high as you need to. Uh, but try to keep it as low as you can so you can get that good mi uh, good mask mix. And now at 1%, we'll have just a little bit of influence from this first node, but we'll have mostly what we need. 
uh, and, and a good mask to go with it. So I'm gonna delete that, we don't need the auto level. And when you look at this, our rocks are coming through and we had a, a good boundary mask. I know that's kind of a long explanation, um, but it's important for you to know that. Next would be flatten, and uh, this is really why we're using the insert node. The reason why uh, we want to play with the flatten area is because in some er in, in nature where there's big rocks, the ground underneath it will be a little bit more flat, um, a, a little bit more stabilized because uh, the rock plays a good uh, role in reducing erosion. Same thing for like trees and its root system. So when you increase the flatten area, you can see here in this area, you have hills uh, or I guess this little bump right here coming in and this bump right here and the rocks right here are being pushed down into the landscape. So let's go ahead and decrease the flatten here as you can see that um, and, and everywhere for that matter. So this is important for getting a rather good natural look. Some of these rocks are going to appear um, in the flatter areas and then you're going to have the landscape pop up on both sides of them because the the landscape here was actually being blocked by the erosion in some way or uh, form or another. <clears throat> um, and you can play with the flatten as much as you want. And, and again, this is why I'm using the insert node is mostly because of this option right here. You can use the add node with combine and that will give you similar results. Uh, it'll give you just this without the flatten, but I want a little bit of that flatten coming in because I want these rocks to be pushed down into the ground where they kind of belong with a more natural look. Now the extent is going to take your insert node and extend it above the input. This is the input multifractal. And um, the more you extend it, the more though that, that insert node's gonna come through. So you'll get even more flat areas, more like simple areas like this. And if you extend it all the way down, as you can see here, we're getting really sharp details on our rocks. And up here, it's getting pushed down into the landscape. Uh, so we don't necessarily want that, but we do want a good balance between how much these rocks extend in to or out from the landscape. And this, as you can see here, the good set of uh, the flatten option here, they're kind of being pushed into the ground a bit. That's pretty nice, but just a little too much. So I'm going to increase the extend probably to 7%. I think that looks good. Now at this point, let's just double check our boundary, which should still be good. Yep, all right, that's still good. So we're still good here. You can keep that auto level on if you want. Uh, I'm not gonna. Now, for the rocky node here, you just play with the seed until you find a good mixture of rocks that you want. I find that if you have some big ones like this that are kind of chunked apart, uh, and these smaller ones all over the place, that makes a pretty good look. You can see here, I got like a bed of boulders and then small rocks everywhere else. Also, the rocky node has a mask. So you can apply a mask to the rocky node and have them appear at specific altitudes or slopes. Just remember that if you're using a slope mask, it will probably make a lot of noise. So I recommend probably an angle mask rather than a slope mask because rocks are gonna appear more at angles. I actually haven't tried it with an angle, so let's go ahead and give that a go. And we'll use the output from the multifractal, and we'll go ahead and plug that into the, the angle output to the rocky. And we'll use, um, um, we'll use something like maybe 50 degrees, something like that. So where there's white, that's where the rocks will appear. Where there's black, that's where they won't appear. So let's let's play with something until we find maybe 155. There you go. And now when we look at it in the insert node, we have rocks appearing at 155 where there's white, and then not just all over the place. They're kind of a little bit more um, in line with a specific angle. So you can definitely do that if you wanted. 
and you could probably get some pretty good interesting results doing this. Uh, let's play around with the minimums here. No, we don't want that. Let's reduce the max. There we go. There we go. Now we have a little lo less rocks going on, uh, so that might be a little too much. But now they're appearing at more of a specific angle that might make more sense. So definitely something that you can do. I recommend playing around with something to um, some of those different data maps to kind of help you decide where you want to put these rocks. But if you like them just kind of scattered around like this, that works too. That's what I did, and it worked fine, and, and it looked good. So I didn't really care too much about it. Um, now that we have our landscape put together, that's just the three nodes there. Um, but we do want some erosion. And you can put the erosion before or after or before and after the multifractal in the insert. So if you wanted to process your multifractal a little bit, give it its own unique look, you can do that before the insert node or you can do it after um, or you can do it before and after is what I mean. Uh, I like to do it after um, because I want this, these rocks to be eroded with the landscape so it looks a little bit more interesting and uh, more natural. Um, that way you're not having, uh, what's it called? You're not having erosional patterns that are conflicting with each other. That way when it comes to, uh, when it's coming to coloring your landscape, you won't have rocks that are taking on like flow patterns from the second erosion node. You'll be, just that one erosion node will be plenty. It also makes it, the, the erosion itself also makes it look really nice where you have like these boulders right here are a little bit harder. So you get more of a flow going on the sides of them rather than through them. Um, I really like the way that looks. And this is more like, you know, a nice green hill with a bunch of white rock or you can do like lava rock or something like that. It's all up to you. Now the default erosion is actually a bit too much in my opinion. Uh, it, it just adds a little bit too much detail where like in a more natural hill look it's very detailless usually it's covered with grass it's hard to tell um, but you will get these like uh, little valleys like this and little uh, crevices so to keep that i like to um, increase the inhibition um, i believe we want to and yeah we want to increase the inhibition um, that way we still get the valleys being created but they're not as strong and you can increase the down cutting as well. That will give you more of the valley look that we had or those crevices that we had before. They just won't be filled in with a lot of sediment because of the inhibition. Um, at some point, you're going to get some um, results that won't return anything just because of how these two settings work with each other. But an easier thing to do rather than increasing the down cutting is to uh, keep that low I, or defaults you can use just the defaults and then um, decrease rock softness softness and that will bring back some of these crevices the downside to that is you're going to impact these rocks which are considered hard if you increase the rock soft softness you're going to get less of that because um, the the let me rephrase that again sorry i'm getting a little ahead of myself if you decrease the rock soft softness, these rocks are going to be hard, but you're going to also tell Gaia that this little patch of hill right here and here and here and here, uh, those are also going to be harder. That is why you'll get more of those crevices coming down. As you can see here, you can see it's being created here more. Um, but you're also getting these really standout stark areas. We want this hill to be a little bit more smooth, at least I do. So increasing the rock softness makes sense. We're also going to get a lot more sedimentation doing that. Um, so that's just another workaround that you can you can use to, uh, rather than increasing the down cutting, you can just play with the rock softness. I'm also going to reduce the duration by 2%. And if any of you are followers of my early Gaia tutorials, I almost always reduce the duration of the erosion to something like 1 or 2%. The, the erosion back then was much harder um, and stronger than it is now. It seems like it's been rained in a lot. Um, but I like to reduce the duration a bit just because, uh, especially for a build like this, because you're not going to see a whole lot of that 
erosional pattern going on because it's going to be covered with grass and other things. Uh, so we don't need to have strong erosion. We just need to have something that helps m build our mesh and make it look a little more natural, which this one looks a little more natural than it did before. So that's what we had before. And I know it's very mellow, uh, and the, but this is what we have after. So there will be areas that you will see the erosion being affected, like right here. But um, for the most part, it's just going to be covered. Okay. So at this point, you can continue processing with different effects if you want. I'm not going to. I'm actually going to start texturing, and I'm not going to do a big in-depth texture tutorial here. Um, I have a lot of guides on texturing in Gaia. It has changed since uh, those guides were made just because it, they were done in older versions, but my process hasn't changed. So I will usually use as many data sets, uh, texture nodes or whatever that I need to use to get a good look. Um, so my process hasn't changed, though some of the things in Gaia has changed. The process remains the same. So I'm not going to break it all down uh, with some big like 20 node texturing, uh, I guess, show. It's just going to be a few nodes here and then we're going to import it in C4D and we're going to start texturing in a different way inside C4D. This is going to be our base color map though. So we need to have something to put on the ground for um, Cinema 4D to use. So we're just going to make our base diffuse. I'm going to do that with one texture node. It's just going to use the default values here. I'm not going to change anything. Uh, but I am going to find a sat map that will work correctly here for us. And a good one to use is one that's green and brown. So something kind of like this. And if we right click on our erosion node and hit pin as underlay, we'll be able to see our landscape as it's being colored. This one right here works really well because we have nice uh, dirt deposits as well as nice deposits for the rock and we have grass growing in between. Let's increase this to one case just so we can see some of the detail. There we go. That's looking all right. Um, these rocks will be textured in a slightly different fashion inside of Cinema 4D, but it, they'll, this will be a half decent color map for the landscape. Um, we will also be using our boundary from our insert to texture the rocks a bit. One more thing before we do that though, let's go ahead and bring out a surface node. The surface node will be attached to our erosion. And as you can see here, in these areas, we have slightly more detail coming through. So if we go back to our erosion node and back to our surface, um, the surface node is just going to bring in a bit more enhancement to our underlying um, landscape here. And I'm going to go ahead and keep that on there and pin this one as underlay. And before we get too far into our texturing, I'm just going to connect the texture node to the surface node. And that's not going to be the only surface node we use. So, uh, But this will be the one that we use as our final uh, landscape node. That or we'll probably have one more. It really depends on how I feel. <laughs> we might have one for the rocks. So let's go ahead and take this boundary out. Let's uh, put it to an auto level. We don't need the auto level. It's already a pretty good mask on its own. I just like using the auto level in case I need to control anything. Uh, but as you can see here, our boundary will select the rocks only. And now from here, we can add another texture node. And the texture node will just break up this plain white um, selection that we have from the mask. Uh, we're actually going to attach that to the surface. And then we're going to use the auto level as a mask for the texture. There we go. So now we are making the proper selection for the slopes and the tops of our rocks here. Now that will be uh, driving one sat map. So let's go ahead and throw out a sat map. And just so you guys can follow along with this a little easier, I'll move the texture there. And this rock right here actually might do pretty well. So let's just keep that one for now. And let's combine these two sat maps together. 
and we will use um, this auto level as the mask for the combine. And we'll just turn the blend all the way up. So this set map just doesn't quite do it. It blends in a little bit too much with the landscape. Um, it has similar color variations. So I'm actually going to change this to be more contrasted. I've used this one in the past. You can see that one might work for some situations, but that one has too much of this brownish color in it. So if we reduce the slider here, we might introduce a little more of that white and green. Um, this could be like a lichen covered rock top, but I don't like that either. So let's, let's find something else. Another one that I have used before and really liked was this one right here, 234. That one right there actually looks really good. Um, let's keep that one for now. And let's use this auto level again for a rock map right here. Uh, we're going to put the rock map up here into the surface. And then the auto level will be the mask that we want for the rock map. And now the, what that'll do is we already had the breakup from the texture, but now we're going to break up that texture with a rock map. Um, and we're going to actually use a different colored sap map for this. We'll find one that is slightly different. Something like that, maybe. I'm not entirely sure. I'm winging it. So we'll just start with that, I suppose. And then we'll use this rock map as the mask for the combine. Let's go ahead and increase the blend all the way. There we go. And now that adds just a little bit of color on top, but I don't know if I like that sat map. So let's find a different one. Don't like that one either. Uh, maybe, maybe that. So it gives it a little bit of dusting on top. I like that one. Yep, I think that's the winner. All right, um, let's do protrusion real quick. We'll attach that to surface. And if we take this protrusion and turn it all the way up, it'll give us a really interesting mask that we can use. And we can use the combine here to kind of bring it in or out depending on our needs. So let's go ahead and set up another set map here. And we'll combine them immediately just so we can see what kind of effect we're getting. We'll change the set map if we need to. Uh, but we're just going to combine it immediately, set up the protrusion as the mask, and then just play with the blend. As you can see here, it's bringing out these areas. Just a tad bit. I think the set map we have blends in a bit too well. So let's, let's find like um, green. Let's look at something green real quick. That's hitting our rocks because they're protruding out, so that's good. We have like this mossy green growing on top of our rocks. So let's find a good green one. This one's usually pretty good. There we go. They're a bit more mossy. And we also have moss growing on the ground from the protrusion, so that works out pretty well. <clears throat> I think that one's probably a little better. Okay, so now we just play with the ratio. So if that 100% is too much, we could always reduce it maybe to 75. There we go. That's good. I don't think we need to do anything else there. I think the rocks look good. The landscape looks good. We don't have to do any kind of noise break up here. Uh, what we could probably do just real quick is take our where apply an auto level to it um, apply an equalize um, keep it like this for now and then um, we might change the layout here but let's add a sat map and we're going to choose a sandy 
color, something maybe like that. And depending on the layout, because this is a layer based uh, texture workflow, we might need to put this one further up in the layers uh, uh, layer chain. But let's see what it looks like real quick without doing that. So I think at 45, that would look good, but let's change the color. No, definitely not. Maybe. Yeah, that could look good. We need to apply this before the rocks though. So the rocks are right here. So let's go ahead and bring this up. This is the first one, so let's bring this up. Take these two, take those up, apply that there, and that there. There we go. And then we'll just fix this real quick. Um, yes. Set map. Hold on. I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. This one goes. Guy is going to be weird here. It got that plus sign, and that plus sign makes it really hard to go away sometimes, and then things don't work out very well. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Now we'll take this mask. Oh, we'll just come on. There we go. Thank you. All right. So we go from there to this to this. All right. And now we'll reduce the blend. We had 45 before, but I think 40 is going to be good here. Um, this auto level does come from the erosion. Good. Okay. Um, so now let's just make sure we get this cleaned up because I don't want to get confused here because I tend to confuse myself sometimes. That's our first combine there. Okay. The second combine should go to this, which should be based off of that surface. Yes, so that will go to that texture. Okay, let's not do this. Sometimes if it gives me that plus symbol on my mouse, I just throw in a node and it goes away. And then I just delete that node. All of my programs are not behaving right now and it's frustrating. So let's go ahead and take this. There we go. Plug it into that. Now this one has to go to this one. And this mask needs to go to the rock map. There we go. That will be a hundred this one will also be 100. This one will be 40. Yes. Okay. Now, that one, this one right here, and the mask will go to the protrusions. There we go. And that should do it. Hopefully, I did that correctly. And if I did, no, because something's being left out here. What the heck? Oh, duh. There. All right. I was wondering why it looked like that. Okay. So let's increase the noise here. Five might be too much. The noise is nice, 
but I do wish that it had a noise scale so I can reduce the noise scale on that and make it so it's not as large of a noise. Okay, let's get these lined up with their respective nodes. Right there, right there. Okay, there and uh, come on, there we go. There and right there. All right, that looks good. That'll be all we're going to get. Uh, we don't need to have such a big, large, intricate selection here because um, uh, or color pa uh, color mask here because we're going to be covering it with all sorts of objects like grass or rocks or whatever, but mostly just grass. And that'll be it. So let's get one more thing. Uh, normal. We want a normal map. This is also, I think, maybe the fourth time that I've tried doing this video. I'm really hoping this will work this time around. Okay, we're gonna mark the normal map for export. The surface will be marked for export. And this last combine right here will also be marked for export. There we go. Now that'll be our color, our normal, and our uh, height map. Let's go ahead and set up a build location. I'm also extremely tired. I have been awake for a very long time. <clears throat> the combine will be the color map, so we'll just keep that as a PNG. Surface, we'll do TIFF 16. Normal map, we'll do PNG. Let's do 4K, so 4096. All that looks good. Let's go ahead and start the build. I didn't save it. We'll just save it in here as whatever. There we go. Let's build it out. And as you can see here, it's not a very big build. It's uh, most of it's coloring. So I also really just like coloring in Guy. It's one of my favorite parts uh, of a build is doing the texturing at the end. And I really like that. But the actual landscape itself is not very big. I try not to make super complicated, long node graphs because there are good reasons to have a big intricate node graph but if you can find a way to do things with less then that's better um, the more important thing is is that you try to get as much detail out of as many few nodes as possible rather than trying to insert more detail with a lot of nodes especially in a program where you're going to have to build that out um, the more of that small detail you're trying to place in with a bunch more nodes, the, the more calculations there is. So I'd rather have like one or two nodes that puts things where I need them to be, if possible, rather than like 20 or 30. Um, but when you're building things from scratch, it's a lot easier to get the details you want anyways. If you're doing something with like a digital elevation map, that's going to be different. So your workflow has to be able to be adaptable, I guess I should say. Okay, it took about five minutes for a 4K build, um, but I totally forgot to set the insert node for export because we need to have that uh, boundary. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uncheck the output here because the only thing I want is the boundary, and I'll use a PNG for that as well. And let's go ahead and export it one more time. Um, while that's going, I'm going to go ahead and open up Cinema 4D. Okay, so while that's building out uh, for that boundary mask, let's go ahead and set up what we need inside of Cinema 4D. So I just have a default scene here made, and I recommend that for whatever renderer that you are using, that you make a default scene layout. That way your, your work uh, is a lot quicker, and you don't have to do a lot of repetitive tasks. Okay, so... Uh, we know the first thing that we're going to need to do is change the size of our plane here. And if my mouse is slow, it's because of that build. It's taking up all my processing power, so it is a little jittery. Um, the landscape inside of Gaia is 5,000 by 5,000 meters um, in width and length. The height is 2,600 meters. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a much smaller plane than that. 
We don't want a very large plane for this scene because the camera is going to be closer to the ground and that makes the rocks look smaller, the landscape looks smaller, and it makes the population of vegetation a lot easier on our computer uh, or in our scene. And since these are just rocks scattered across the landscape, we don't need big cliffy plateau shaped objects uh, surrounding our camera. So that's another reason why we're going to reduce the size. Sorry, I had to sit there and say that without um every other word. So I had to close my eyes and really think about what I was going to say. So the width and height that we're going to use inside of Cinema 4D is going to be, um, let's go for 100 meters. There we go. So we have to do the math here. If we went from 5,000 meters down to 100 meters and the height of our landscape is going to be 2,600 meters reduced down, it's not quite a one-to-one -one or not quite a um, division, uh, division of two. It's like 1.9 something, 1.9 three, two or two, three or something like that. So we need to um, take that number and we need to go from 100 and down. So let's, uh, oops, control Z, control Z, control Z. I don't know what just happened there. Uh, we need 100, there we go. So let's open up a calculator here um, and let's do, let's clear that, 5,000 divided by 2,600, that equals, yeah, I was pretty close, 1.923, so we'll just do that. Now we'll clear that, let's take 100 and divide that by that, it's going to be about 52. Okay, so let's make sure we got a boundary, we do, okay. So let's make the height of our displacer in the object tab. We go to height here. Let's make that 52. And we'll see if that works out the way we need it to. If it's too large, we'll reduce it. If it's not large enough, we'll just increase it. Uh, there's our surface. If we go to mapping, turn off tiling. And when we do that, we get rid of this. So that'll be like that border from the tiling that's supposed to happen there. Let's turn that off. We no longer have that issue. All right. And yeah, that looks about right. Uh, that gives us the result that we're looking for. That looks more or less one for one that we got from Gaia. So we don't have to worry about reducing this or increasing it at all. That looks, that looks okay. Now, um, what we'll do is we'll just right click our plane there and current state to object and that will create a nice little object that we can use right here which we will name ground. and now since we did that we can now change the axis right here we'll use this tool bring that down there we go that looks good and now we have a properly set axis as well Okay, so that's good. Let's set up um, quick, real quick, a figure. This figure is what's going to help us visualize our location and everything else. So uh, I like using a figure or a mannequin or whatever for this kind of stuff. Uh, just makes life a little bit easier in visualizing things. So we're going to be about right there this might not be where we keep the camera but this will definitely be where we set stuff up and help us visualize stuff and what i like to do is just put the camera down to where the eyeballs would probably be so about right there and then just turn the figure off and there we go now we have a camera more or less about where we would want it to be the the figure itself is 1.8 meters i am two meters um but that doesn't change things hard like if you look here the camera itself isn't moving all that much so 
it doesn't really matter if you set it at your exact height or just a little bit lower or higher as long as you got it in ballpark range now the reason why i do this for texturing is because it gets us close to the ground so we can see how much that texture repeats the kind of detail we're getting out of that texture and whether or not we need to implement more uh, effects through our node here, node graph here, with Corona's tools, so like triplanar or UVW mapping. Triplanar will most certainly be something that we're using just because we have these steep edges here that I would want to use uh, triplanar for to try to reduce texture stretching. UVW mapping or random UVW mapping might not be something that something that we'll need, so we will just kind of play it by how things look during that time. Uh, but I know for certain that we're probably going to be using uh, triplanar. Before we do anything else though, let's go ahead and create a, a material here. So I just double click in here and I have Cinema 4D set up where it creates a Corona material by default when I double click in here. If you wanna change that, you go to edit and preferences. And this isn't going to be like a how to configure your Cinema 4D application or customize it however you want, but I'll show you this real quick. And for some reason, my preferences take forever to pop up, so I apologize for that. If you go to, yeah, edit preferences and then go to uh, material, you can change which one you want to load in right here. So the default material, I have it set to Corona physical. You can set it to octane material, or you can set it to any of these other materials that Cinema 4D has built into it. So uh, I like to use the Corona material by default because that's my current render engine of choice until I move on to something else or want to try something else. Uh, hint, hint. Anyways, um, let's go ahead and rename this material to ground. This way we don't lose track of which material is which and we'll just apply that to ground. Uh, okay, so now we will drop this into this node graph editor right here. This is the one that um, Corona Render comes with, but you can actually use this node graph for pretty much any material system that you want to use. I've used this for Octane materials as well, um, but uh, I do prefer Octane's material editor, node graph editor for its own materials, but you can definitely use that for this. Use this specific one for Octane. Um, I just like the way we can set up different views here for different materials, and we can also link in multiple views into this node system. So it's a lot like Gaia, where we have one main node graph, but then we can do like graphlets, and it and it just kind of works with what I like inside of uh, Gaia and Cinema 4D. Okay, let's bring in our materials here, or our textures. We want our color and our normal. And just to see what they look like, let's just go ahead and apply them. We will need a Corona normal node here for it to work. Um, that goes into the bump, yep, there we go. And before we get the uh, normal map to work, we do have to enable bump. I wish this just came enabled, enabled, enabled by default, and I wish that Corona was just smart enough to notice a normal map over a bump map, but it's okay, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but if you look at this uh, ball right here, it's looking pretty good right now. We can add a noise to this a little later if we want to, if we need some additional detail, but let's see what we have so far. I was going to do this as a live stream, but it was already too late and I actually have a job interview tomorrow, so um, I don't want to be up super late. I want to be able to get to bed and get some rest, so. Uh, I'll be working for the same company, just a different position, or interviewing for a different position is all. Okay, so I don't want to lose this spot for our camera, so I'm just going to copy our camera. I'll go use that one as my main camera, and now we can pan around. The rocks themselves are looking okay. We don't have any weird texture stretching or distortions uh, outside of the normal... Um, you know, stretching that we got out of Gaia when we create our, our color map. So this is uh, looking quite fine. We don't have as much green coming out as I thought we would, but that's because of the lighting. It's the sun right here. Um, plus the material. We do have a bit of a specular value going on. We don't need that. And we also don't need 
all that roughness. That will help a little bit with representing our OG texture a bit more. But this right now, that's that's looking quite fine. So uh, we can start expanding on this material. So what we're going to do is we are going to combine numerous different textures here from a mega scan texture or whatever custom texture that you have. And we're going to use Cinema 40's tools to do that as, long, as well as Corona's tools to do that. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is find a material we want to use or a texture. So I keep saying material, but I, I mean texture. So let's open up bridge and hopefully it'll open up pretty quick here. We can now remove this. There we go. We don't need that. Okay, and we're also going to use some of these plants that we have inside of Mega Scans as well. So that's going to be another reason why we want to go with this. Um, so what I want is a material for the rocks themselves right now. We don't need anything for the ground. I just want something for the rocks. So we're going to find one that has a pretty decent and cool looking displacement map here that looks really rocky and sharp. Um, and I'm thinking something maybe like this right here or this one right here, Rough Rock. A lot of the Icelandic ones that they have work really well. Um, we just want one that has a really cool displacement. This one, this cracked rock surface might be good too. Uh, let's try this mossy rock one right here. So let's go to those files. We'll grab that location. Actually, we don't need to do that. We can just take these. We, I want the albedo, the AO, the bump, the displacement, norm, rough, and spec. And we'll just plop those all in here. There we go. And then they should pop. Yep, there they are. Okay. So there's everything. Let's move them out of the way. We want that one. We want that one. These other ones, they can just kind of sit by the wayside for now. We'll start with the albedo color. Okay. So to help visualize what's going on here uh, a little bit easier, we're going to use a fusion layer or, or a fusion node. And then we're also going to bring in our boundary. And inside the boundary, for some reason, Gaia is not exporting this um, at its entire like range, I guess. And that could be because it was set to proportional. Um, it shouldn't be doing that, but it is right now. I'm going to change the sampling from MIP to none, and then I'm going to reduce the white point to 0.2, and that will help bring in that uh, mask a little bit more. Now in Fusion, we're going to use mask, Oops. and we're going to use this boundary as our mask. Now um, the base layer will be our color map, and then the blend channel will be our uh, color map from the rock. But before we do anything with that, we need to set this up appropriately so it color it matches the color of our rock as well as uh, scales properly. Before we do that, let's get the uh, ambient occlusion mask in this color map combined. To do that, we're going to use a Corona mixture shader. We're going to use this. It doesn't matter which order you do this in, but I'm just going to put the color on top and the AO on the base, and then we're going to change the mix operation to multiply. Now we have the AO being multiplied into our color map. You can set this up to control it a little bit better, uh, get a little bit more out of it, but I'm not going to. I'm also going to change all these from MIP to none, all these uh, maps as I go along. All right, so. Um, we will want a color correct, so I'm going to use a Corona color correct. I'm not going to change the color of it yet or do anything like that, but we're going to do color correct because I know we're going to want that. 
And then we're also going to use a Corona triplanar. So let's go ahead and plug that into the X axis because we're going to use the uh, map X for all axes. And since in bridge, that one is a two by two meter texture. I'm just going to change this scale to two meters. We'll most likely need to increase that, but for now we'll just set it to two. And then let's go ahead and plug that into the blend channel. And then we'll take the fusion and plug that into the texture. Now what that will do is it will allow us to keep our color map that we made in Gaia, but also now apply that rock map to all of our rocks using that boundary. Looks pretty good in my opinion. Um, but now we got to color correct it. So the rocks were a little bit less dark. So let's go into the color correction here. And let's um, increase the gamma a bit. Uh, maybe two might be too much. Let's do 1.5. I usually like to do a whole step and then work my way down from there. Um, and I think that might be okay right there. We, I think we have a good color. I think it might still be a tad bit too dark. Let's do 1.3. Uh, sorry, uh, 1.7. Let's do 1.7. Uh, I think 1.4 might be okay. I want them to be. I want them to stick out a little bit from the ground, but uh, not be too dark. And I think that's fine. Playing around with the gamma like that was uh, is okay. So um, now to see how this is tiling, there are these other bigger rocks like right here. Let's go ahead and look at those from the top down and see if we can see any noticeable repeating patterns, which there are some repeating patterns, but we're not going to be at this height to be able to see it. But if you wanted to apply a, uh, a Corona UVW randomizer, you can do that. Just add it before the triplanar. So let's go ahead and add it here. Uh, we have to go down here and select randomize each tile. And then we have to change these settings. So let's do an offset of one on the U and the V. And that will shift this texture randomly in the U and V by one. And we'll also set the rotation to something like uh, 180. And we'll just do something like that for now. Let's apply that and then see how that randomizes it. And uh, that, I think that did a pretty good job at randomizing it. We don't get as much of a noticeable um, repeating pattern. So that's good. All right, so that'll be our color. And I think that will work just fine. So now we have to work our way down from here. So now we need to apply a roughness and specular and that'll be applied directly to these rocks themselves. It won't be applied to any of this. That's okay because these are going to be covered by grass. This is. Um, we'll play with um, the bump a little bit. So if there's any area that's not being covered by grass that the camera is noticing, we'll at least have some detail in there. But the main point is to get the details out of the rock. So let's go ahead and find the rough and the spec, and that will be over here somewhere. So this one's the rough specular, and this one's probably the roughness. Yep. Okay. To get these two things to align with each other, what we are going to use is these same things. So those two. Uh, if you uh, do the rectangle select and then hold down control and drag, click and drag, it'll copy those nodes. That's how I did that. Start with the roughness. We'll just plug it straight in there. And we'll need this to tell Cinema 4D where to apply things. So we'll copy this fusion. We'll bring this mask in, the same one, and we need to make sure that we plug this into the blend channel or else we'll get it uh, in the wrong location. And then since we don't need anything else in the base channel here, you can just leave it and go into the roughness. There we go. So now we have our roughness mask being applied to our rock material in the same way the albedo is, that way it lines up properly. Um, now we need to do that for the specular. 
And I'm also going to save because Cinema 4D has been crashing on me and it's been a big pain in the butt. Cut Rock Hill. And it's almost two o'clock in the morning here and I don't want to be up much longer than I need to be because I really need to go to bed relatively soon here. I gotta get up and take care of a baby still and I got an interview that I need to do. So we'll just keep using this rock map. Um, also remember to reduce the mipping. We don't need the mipping being applied here. There we go. This rock uh, boundary map is just going to continue following us all the way down. And let's go ahead and plug that into the specular. And that will give us proper specular highlights on our rocks. So that's good. The fun one is the normal because we also have the normal for our landscape. So let's make sure that we do this correctly. And it should be easy. So we'll just uh, copy those two. Plug that in. I guess I shouldn't even say it's going to be that different. It's going to be almost about the same thing. Um, there's the rock map. Let's plug that in. This is going to go up here. This right here is going to go there. This is going to go there. There we go. Now we have the normal map being applied appropriately. And since we've been copying and pasting that triplanar, it should have kept its two meter size. It has. Okay. So now those rocks are looking pretty fine. The fun one. Another fun one, I guess I should say, is going to be this bump, uh, which is going to be good for uh, the normal. So let's go ahead and plug these in. And we'll just plug that straight into, we need a fusion. That fusion is going to go there, and that is going to go there. This is going to go there. There we go. Now we have that bump map being applied directly where it needs to be on the rocks. That should give us good plenty of detail. So you can see here it's about the same thing over and over again. Um, it is a little bit hectic with all the connections, but it looks good in the end. Trust me. Now we will do our displacement. Take out the fusion. Take our boundary mask plug it in plug in the displacement and we need to enable displacement on the on the material so we click on the main material here go to basic enable displacement and now we'll be able to go down here to the fusion and we'll be able to plug that in to our displacement there we go and now we will be displacing those rocks based on that mask and if you look at the material ball here you'll notice it Maybe. You also notice it on the rocks. There you go. So we have all these rocks being protruded in those specific areas. Now, um, when it comes to the amount that we want to displace, I'm not entirely sure how much that's going to be. If we click on the material, we can get more details on that. We on the material itself. So we have um, it's tileable. It's two by two meters, but it doesn't tell us how much to displace it by, which is fine because um, it's usually by eyeball anyway. So if we go really high, let's start with one meter. That's probably gonna be way too much, but we'll start with that. Let's keep an eye on these rocks. See how they're kind of puffing up a little bit now from that displacement. You'll notice that on the edges, we do get some stretching there and we don't want that. That's when we know we have too much displacement. So let's uh, reduce the minimum level to negative 0.1. We'll start with small amounts here and work our way down. And that, what that should do is it should keep the outward displacement, but then it should reduce this edge, technically. Uh, we'll, we'll do 0.5 actually. 
see. We'll see if that does what I think it should do. I just need to wait for that to update. Yes, there we go. All right, that did not do what I thought it would do. Maybe it was water level? Well, in any case, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to sit here and play with that. It's going to be zero here, and it's going to be like 0.2 here. Because 0.1 was not enough, but one meter was too much. Um, and I think 0.5 might be getting upwards of a little bit too extreme. So. I think that's fine. I, we could probably go a little higher, but I think this is good for now. So let's see what we have at our original camera location. As you can see here, we have a bit more stretching that you can see here on the edges. That's going to be fine because it's going to be covered by grass. It's going to be blocked by grass. Now, if this was an animation that went over the rocks, this probably wouldn't be what you'd want. You'd want actual rock 3D models rather than trying to replicate the rocks um, based on material uh, textures and displacements. You'd want like actual 3D models that won't suffer from this problem, uh, especially the limitations of file-based masking, as you can see. Uh, it's really pixely. But this material itself actually doesn't have a whole lot of extra detail to the displacement. So I'm going to find one that has more of a chunky displacement, maybe something like that slate rock. And I'm just going to use the displacement mask for this one material. I'm not going to, um, oh, wow. It only gave me the albedo. What? That's weird. I'm not even signed in. What the heck? Hold on a sec. There we go. <clears throat> now we're signed in and we're downloading. So maybe now we'll have proper files here. Yes, normal, normal, rough. There's the displacement. OK, we have what we need. All right, we're able to re-download it. Let's bring in this displacement. And um, we'll actually have to have um, the norm. I like the color. Uh, but we'll probably have to have the normal and the displacement, actually. I'm not going to care too much about the roughness and the specular because they're not making too much of a difference here anyways. I just wanted to make sure that we have cool displacement and that one that we're using just is not doing it. It's a little bit too soft still. And I'm only changing the normal here so that we get proper normal shading for the displacement, mostly. Change these MIPS. There we go. All right, now we will change the displacement to be maybe a little bit higher. And we might have to re actually reduce the size in the triplanar here to get more displacement detail coming through. But let's go to 0.5 and we'll see what that does first. Also, what size was this one? That's a good question. It'll be at the top now. It is two by two. Okay. Um, I know why it's not doing it because I don't have the proper setup here. Okay, we might be coming back to this. Okay, hold on. We need these two things. There we go. Plug that in there. I knew I missed something. I just didn't. I'm tired. Leave me alone. Put that there. There we go. Now, let's see how that impacts those rocks. That's much better. Okay. So now that's a little too much. You can see the, the displacement on those rocks is uh, a little insane. It, it can look cool if it's blown out of 
whack like that in some situations, but not this one. Um, now I'm curious, I'm going to bring back the original normal and the original displacement. There we go. Let's get the displacement in first. See how that updates. We're also going to reduce the displacement to like 0.2. Now we're cleaned up. Let's see what that displacement looks like. That should be much better. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, that should be looking a ton better than it did before. Now the displacement for this material still is really smooth. It doesn't have a whole lot of break apart uh, details to it. So we might be going back to the one I was using before, but um, I think we'll be okay. This one's lining up with everything much nicer. No, I think, uh, yeah, we're going to go back to this one. <laughs> I will make up my mind eventually. I shouldn't have deleted all of that stuff. I should have just kept them in while I was testing, but leave me alone. I'm tired. There we go. Uh, it's a good thing I'm only changing these two things. All right, that's the last time I'm changing that. Whatever we get here, uh, we're sticking with it. The only thing that we're going to change is, <coughs> sorry, is the displacement max level. If we need to. Like I said at the beginning of this video, it was going to be a long one. So hopefully it's not too boring for you guys when you're learning some stuff. As long as you're learning things, then we're fine. But I can't help you if you get bored, but as long as you're learning. So I think point two is too much. Let's go to point one. I'm looking right here and here, but the displacement on top of the rocks is fine. Totally fine on top of the rocks. It's just the sides that I'm worrying about at this point. So if we can reduce the amount of the max level to kind of reduce this stretching we have going on, but keep the displacement on the top good, I think we'll be golden. And I'm seeing the displacement here, as well as here, um, as well as here. So I think this in of itself is much better than what we had before. So let's go to our old camera, or our second camera. Move that down. There we go. And um, we're going to just look at the top of these rocks and see what we uh, see if we can see anything that we might need to change. And I don't think there is. We have good rock detail, even on a top down. Um, and we're seeing displacement where we need to see the displacement. So I think we're good here. Um, the next thing that we're going to really work on real quick is the lighting. I'm going to change the, um, not this guy, this guy should be there. The sun, I'm going to reduce the angle to 20. That'll give us some shadows that we can work with. That'll help us view the details in the rocks a bit more. And then we're just going to change the rotation around until we get decent shadows, so maybe about right there. We're getting shadows right here on the rocks on the ground, um, as well as right here and back here. So we have some good good amount of shadows that we can use to look at, and that's good. All right, now let's find some plants. I'm gonna use Megascan plants because they look good, and I also like the way they look. Uh, oh, that was redundant. They look good, and I also like how easy they are to set up. So let's go to the, I'm going to use this thatch, thatching grass. Uh, it's, I, I like using that one. Um, additionally, uh, I am using a stream deck. It should be changing. Um, when I open up Cinema 4D, it should be changing to this 
but it's not. There it is. Okay, now it is. I like the browse to it in the content browser. So um, we have the statching grass, which is U D D M C G B I A. I don't know why they name their stuff like that, but they do. Um, so we got to go here and find whichever one of these is um, that one. It was grass wild. This one right here is our thatching. The reason why I like using the content browser in Cinema 4D is because when I click on these very um, folders, it gives me a preview so I can see what we have. Now, I want good detail close and far away, but I don't want to use LODs because I don't like to set those up. It takes a little bit of time for me still because I'm not used to working in that system. So I just stick with LOD1 and we just click on it and drag it in here and that will merge it into our project. And I'm just going to do that with the first four variants. Um, if you can put more of the variants in there, that's great. But um, if you uh, don't want to, it's okay. I just, I'm using four because that gives us a good amount. And this isn't going to be the only grass that we use. We're going to use another grass type, but we're going to start with this one first. All right, now um, the materials themselves or the textures themselves, we can't bring in through the content browser. I don't know why. I've tried everything I can think of to do that, but I can't get it to work. So we're going to create a new view here inside this graph, and we're going to call this grass one. Um, we're going to create uh, a new material. That material is going to go in here, and it's also going to be renamed to grass one, and it will be assigned to all of our grasses. There we go. Let's go ahead and delete these. We don't need those. All right. And now we're going to work in this node graph right here. Um, since we already have the, the folder for our grass opened here, we'll just drag and drop everything we need in. So we're going to take the albedo, the AO, the normal opacity, rough spec. Um, you can take the translucency if you want. I'm going to do something different, though, and I'll show you. There we go. That should be the AO. Yep. All right. And I'm going to save again. There we are. So just like with our rock, we're just going to use a mix shader to mix the uh, color and the AO together. <clears throat> Let's multiply it together. And we're just going to plug this into a Corona multi shader. There we go. And now we're going to plug our texture into texture one here. And then going down the list here, we're going to pick colors that will help randomize our grass a bit. And since we don't have a whole lot to go off of with our ground and our rock, we're just going to pick a, straight from the uh, color map that we have. So this red color right here is not going to matter because we're bringing in this texture. Um, but the ones below this, so two down will, but we don't need um, six different variants. We can use like four. It uh, um, doesn't matter. We can, you can use six if you want. I'm just going to use four. And then we're just going to choose colors off of this color map that will help us kind of sell the variation checkbox pretty well. We don't want extremely vibrant colors just because... Um, Just because uh, uh, very vi vibrant, bright colors in nature rarely exist. They do exist, um, but they don't exist to such an extent that everything's going to be the same. So we're just going to take that last one, increase the saturation a bit. And now we have more of a dried grass, a slightly dry grass, and a more healthy green grass there. Let's plug that into our texture. And uh, let's enable a few things here on our texture. We're going or our material. We go to basic, and we need to enable our opacity. Um, and we need to go to general, make this a thin shell, and then we need to enable translucency. And now for the translucency, we're going to take this multi shader and plug it straight into the color, and then we're going to increase the fraction 
or in this case decrease the fraction to about 50 percent there we go all right so that'll give us our color and our translucency now the opacity will be plugged in real quick and we'll get to the rest of them in a minute i just want to scatter these around real fast and um, see how varied that color is so i'm going to save first and now this is where cinema 40 crashes every single time and it will do it repeatedly over and over and over and over again and every time i make a single adjustment for my scatters so to fix that i can't have corona running while i'm making those adjustments so i gotta stop the vfb here and then we can just work on our scatters i'm going to use surface spread take all these grasses put them in there and then i'm going to use in surface spread under object i'm going to drop my ground and now they'll be scattered all over the place on my surface there we're going to increase the the, the counts here though um probably 10,000. There's not going to be any specific selection of grass here. I just want there to be a lot so I can see the color variation. 50,000 will work. Now we can start the VFB and it should work, hopefully. Come on. I didn't use that many. Yes, we are getting some variations. So we have these um, dried up grass bits here. Um, we have more healthy grass, and then we have slightly, uh, slightly less healthy grass and then healthy grass. So we are getting the variation, um, but if you wanted to have this be more of a realistic spread of variation, you could use really dry grass in a different um, uh, material that's mostly dry and then you can use whatever parameters in your scatter program to place them in specific areas I'm not going to do that I'm just going to actually go into the uh, multi shader here and I'm going to reduce this one right here to maybe a light very light green or maybe a slightly darker green that's a uh, Reduce the saturation on these a bit. A little higher. There we go. So now that will be, uh, so there, there's still variation, but there's not as many dead ones, just kind of sporadically set, uh, scattered around. Okay, I think that will be fine. So let's go ahead and hook everything else up. This one right here is roughness, specular, and uh, we'll need a Corona normal node. Into the bump. And then we also have to enable that bump. So let's go ahead and enable it. There we go. And uh, I think that will do it for our grass. Now uh, we need to do one more thing for this grass in the scatter before we are actually done. Let's go to create material. And we're going to create a standard material. Um, and the reason why is because this is going to be our grass rock mask uh, or our rock mask because surface spread does not work with non-standard uh, Cinema 4D materials inside of the distribution here. Um, I'm going to use no reflectance and in color I'm going to put in our um, boundary from our insert node, change the white point to point 0.2, no mipping, um, and I'm going to use this as a distribution material mask for surface spread. So if I go to distribution, filter by material, I can drop this material in, and since in that mask we have our rocks being selected, I can invert it to deselect the rocks, so make instead of the white parts of the mask that are white where our rocks are, they are now black and the surrounding areas around them are now white. So the grass will appear everywhere else except for on top of our rocks. In order to see this happen though, we need to increase the intensity and I just increase it to 100%. And now our rocks 
no longer have grass growing on top of them. So that uh, makes it really nice uh, in order to not get ro uh, grass growing on top of the rocks that we don't want them to grow on top of. So let's go ahead and start up the VFB again. It's almost 2.30. Holy crap. I knew I should have started this a lot sooner, but I wanted to spend my, some time with my wife. So, But she fell asleep, and then as soon as she fell asleep, I was like, well, I better go get that done now. All right. So uh, no plants on top of our rocks. That's good. That's what we want. Um, we have grass growing everywhere else. We still have the variation in the grass. Um, that's good. Now we just need more of it. Um, and then we got to change our lighting around a bit, and then we're done. The rocks themselves, I think, look quite fine. Um, if we wanted to, we could change the camera angle around, which we might do still. So we we'll, we'll, we still got a few things that we need to get done, but I think this is coming along. All right, so <clears throat> uh, let's add more plants here. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat is starting to get really dry. This would have been a good one to use for the rocks, actually. We'll come back to that later, though, <clears throat> if we need to. I'm going to use this river salt brush because I think that looks really cool as well. And I actually haven't used it in a long time. Uh, and I think it'd be a good contrast for this. And I'm actually going to use a fractal breakup method for this, where you'll see like swaths of them uh, going through the landscape in the, in the breakup. But I'll show you that when we get to it. So this one's going to be called ground cover plant vid here. So let's open up our content browser and uh, let's look for ground cover right there. And we'll just drop in LOD ones for that one. And this one, and we'll, we'll use four. Oh, and uh, let's not use the VFB for this because that's a good way to get Cinema 4D to crash on me. And it looks like Lot 4 is in its own little area for some reason. It's okay, we'll just use that one. <clears throat> we'll copy this surface spread because it's more or less what we want. We're, we're, we're going to be making uh, some adjustments on both of them still, but uh, we'll just use it as a shortcut for now. Let's turn that one off. And as you can see here, it's it's copied our material for the, the masks, for the rocks and whatnot. Now we just got to create another material here called this grass two and assign that to all of these. And if you wanted to save yourself some time, uh, you could just copy the material that you made for the other grass and then just re-import the, the textures for the that second grass type. But uh, I don't really care too much to do that. So I'm gonna create another view. We're gonna call this grass two. Drop that in there. And uh, let's import our textures. Normal opacity, rough spec. There we go. All right. That's our rough. That's our AO, and that's our color. All right. And we're just going to set this up the exact same way we did before with the other one. There's literally no change here except for that. Um, we're going to be using different colors in the multi shader is all. Uh, and we're probably just going to use four variations. And since this is already a pretty white, really light colored plant, uh, it might be hard to choose different colors, but it's still important to choose something that is varied. So pick one that's maybe a little more green than the other, pick one that's a little bit more brown, a little darker. It's so like this one right here, we can increase the saturation on this one to like 30. Now it's a little bit more yellow. 
This one we can increase the lightness a bit and the saturation. So now this is going to be a little more orange, um, pink almost. And then that one is probably a good color to have already. There we go. Uh, we got to enable our um, opacity as well as our translucency. There we go. Color translucency, change that to 50%. There we go. Now everything else is as simple as plugging it in and calling it good. There are ways to control like your roughness and your specular a little bit better to bring out some additional uh, details if needed in some way, but I don't do that for the most part. I just kind of stick with the masks that are provided um, and only really change them if I'm going for some extreme amounts of realism, if that makes sense. Like for a final render or a project or um, uh, like when I'm contracted out for something and they want ridiculous amounts of detail and whatnot. So, But in this case, I'm not going to really do that. But you are more than lucky, or more than, not lucky, uh, you are more than welcome to do that if you want. Okay, so that's good. Let's go ahead and hit Save Project, and let's do uh, the VFB here and see what kind of variation we get in these plants. And if it's good, and we don't have to change the multi-shader, then we'll go ahead and change the surface spread parameters a bit on both of those and we will uh, see if we can get some randomization going on in places where we need it. So you can see here, we have extremely white plants, but then we also have some gray and some tan plants. And that is a little bit too much, so uh, let's stop that. And this is why I really wish when using Corona render, um, when I'm like making changes to my project files and whatnot, that um, it wouldn't crash on me because I most certainly could benefit from being able to see these changes in real time. But uh, it crashes. Uh, well, all I'm doing is I'm reducing the saturation on all of these because it's a very unsaturated very light color plant so reducing the saturation on those might give us a good amount of variation i just didn't want them to be so contrasted with each other i guess is a good way to put it there we go and like i said it's supposed to be a very bright and light color um, that first texture is a lot more light than the surrounding ones so it still sticks out quite well quite a bit so what we'll do is we'll just take this and we will apply a corona color correct to it and I'm gonna save just in case it crashes. Actually, you know what? Screw it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna chance it. We're almost done here. And for this color correct, I'm just gonna take the gamma, um, and I'm going to reduce it by just a little bit, maybe 0 0.7. There we go. And uh, let's see what that did. And if that didn't do enough, we'll just reduce it more, and then we'll reduce the brightness if we need to. I'm hoping to finish this tutorial by 3 o'clock. Right now it's 2.33. So hopefully we'll have like the lighting done and the uh, scatters done and all that fun stuff before then. Uh, we might have to go down maybe even further. Let's do 0.4. It's quite a bit. Please do not crash. It did not crash. But it didn't really change this as much as I would want it to. So the brightness it is, let's do negative 0.5. Ooh, negative 0.1. There we go. I'm just trying to make these individual plants not as bright. Uh, 
Um, it's still not doing it. Point one. That's really dark. I don't know if that's actually doing anything. I don't see it doing anything. I'm missing. I'm missing it somewhere. Okay. Well, that didn't do it. Oh, duh. That's because the mix operation isn't set to multiply. There we go. That will help. <laughs> there we go. I knew if we just troubleshot it a little bit, we'd be able to figure it out. Sometimes you just got to take a step back and look around. All right, so even with the, the adjustments that I made, uh, we still got a good amount of variation out here. So we got some lighter colored ones, some greener ones, and some darker tannish ones but they all kind of blend really nicely together and the nice thing about this plant is that it's very wide and long like a sagebrush so you don't need a whole lot of them to get a lot of space covered um, so we won't need a whole lot of these we'll just need more of the other ones um, or what we can do is we can keep these being scattered the way they are just randomize them a bit more and we can use less of these and use this one for our um, our fractal breakup, which is what I'm going to do actually. So let's let's change some stuff around real quick and then see how it looks. We'll stop the VFB and uh, let's um, we will use a performance filter here. We're going to use our camera. This one we're going to do a camera cone. This will help reduce the amount that we have scattered on the edges here where the camera can't see them. I always just do anywhere between one to five degrees of um, a correction angle, just so if I do an animation, um, there's always plants being populated during that animation, but also because it helps fill in the gaps here on the edges a bit more, so you don't have an obvious cone look. So I just like to do that just for that reason. <clears throat> All right, so the in the effects, let's go to random scale. I'm going to scale these all randomly 100%, but I'm also going to use noise. Now you'll notice that that reduces the amount of scaling that happened. There's still randomize, randomization going on, but what we'll do is we'll change the noise scale. So if we increase the noise scale, you can see here how we're getting um, some pretty good randomization uh, in a noise pattern rather than just every plant being randomized uh, individually. So now we're using noise to, con to control that randomization. Um, that way we have plants that are growing taller and shorter next to each other in uh, a more natural flowy pattern. Uh, and that looks much better in my opinion. For the random alignment, we're just going to keep it right here at 360 and just increase it to 100. Sometimes if you go to 500, you can really increase the amount of rotations each plant takes before it's done randomizing, um, but 360 is usually fine. All right, now we'll do the same thing for this one, um, but we need to change the uh, a few things like we did before, so let's go ahead and drop that in. We'll use the camera cone. Uh, we'll do 2% for the camera cone. And then in the effects, again, we'll just do uh, random scale. Use noise. And noise, we'll just do two there. And then for here, we'll do 500. And there, we're done. Um, to see the fractal breakup we're going to get for these plants, I'm going to turn this one off and turn this one back on. I'm going to save it. <clears throat> And um, let's go ahead and go back to our distribution and we're going to turn on fractal breakup. Now in Cinema 4D with surface spread, it's weird because if you increase the noise scale for the fract fractal breakup, you would think that that noise would get larger 
and you could see more of that break up. But the thing is that the noise scale actually seems to get smaller and you don't see that break up as much. So to fix that, um, we'll increase the intensity to 100. That also makes us lose a bunch of our instances. So let's go ahead and increase this to a rather what you would think might be a ridiculous amount, uh, but it's not. Uh, as you can see here, we have what 100,000, and we're only getting 4,169 clones. So we're going to have to really increase this before we get a good decent amount. There, that should be that should be plenty for visualizing this. Let's go back to distribution and change the noise scale to like 0.1. And you can see here, that's our breakup. That's also our breakup. So let's go even further, 0.05. There we go, we got a break up here and break up there. And if I were to increase this number, it would just you to it would get to a point where you wouldn't even notice a difference. So let's go to point zero three. So that, that's too much. So let's go to point zero uh, six, maybe. That was point six, and point zero six. There we go. So then we got a patch right there that's kind of open. If we were to go back to this camera let's uncheck this because it takes forever for the camera to update when you're using uh, that surface spread visualization that's our fractal breakup you can see the, the noise pattern we're getting right there and if i were to put this at one you can see here we do get breakup but it's so small that it's not even really noticeable so if we do point zero one you can see we have more breakup um, and that's actually too big. So we gotta go back to like 0 0.06, which I think is the sweet spot here. 0 0.06 looks like it might be the, the best one here. Now, what we'll have to do is um, uh, add in our other ones and see how that fares. It looks like it fares pretty well. So we'll just turn both of these off, go back to our camera re-enable them and yes i do that it's very redundant but if i don't it takes forever for the camera to update and then sometimes cinema 40 crashes so now let's see what that looks like and this is the nice thing about having two different plant types especially one that's a little bit shorter but more broad is that it covers more of the ground it's a lot harder to or it's a lot easier to cover the underlying ground um, without having a lot of uh, instances and then you can rely on a second plant to kind of help break up the verticality of it all so instead of a nice really flat ground we now have plants poking up in a more of a random pattern like this and now we don't have to worry about having a extremely detailed ground texture uh, because we're covering it with plants now you'll notice here and here we have an issue so we might need to increase the camera cone angle a bit to resolve that. Um, but as it looks right now, we have a good variety of plants here. We have, um, and this green plant, the thatch grass is appearing only in specific locations uh, because of that fractal breakup. So that's good. Um, if you wanted that fractal breakup to be less detailed so that the plants only really appear more uniformly, you can increase the detail amount for that noise. I didn't, but you could do that. Um, and they're still not growing on top of the rocks for the most part. There is one that's growing right here, but that's probably because it's more of a mask issue. But we do have rocks popping in here, 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 back here, here, and here, and uh, we have a nice hill. So. Uh, and on top of that, we also have nice details popping in on these rocks. So now let's just fix this part right here. So we might have to increase the camera cone angle, or we can get a rock object or a plant object to put right there. So uh, that way we don't have to increase the amount of clones we have. But since um, Corona Render is a GPU or a CPU-based rendering engine, 
we can actually increase the clone amounts quite a bit and that won't actually impact our scene all that much but if you wanted to um, optimize your scene more you would want to probably manually place in an object there to help block those spots um, that way you don't increase your clone amounts especially if you're using something like octane where you have where you have a lot more limited resources okay uh, let's stop this and let's just increase the clone angle I'm just going to take the easy way out. Actually, you know what? I don't even think this one would be the easy way out. I think we're going to actually have to do this the right way. Oh, what a shame. Okay, we'll just copy this one. We'll put this under our figure. You can go to Mesh, Axis, Center to Parent. Take it out of the parent, put it back up here. I'm just doing this for organization purposes. Um, doing that actually moved the object from wherever it was to underneath the figure, which is what we need because I need to be able to see it. Um, and let's go to the second camera and let's move it out this way so we can see it in the camera view. And now we're gonna go back to this camera Enable this. Uh, actually, I think we want to enable this one. And we're, we're just going to plop this down here on the ground. And then we're also going to increase the scale quite a bit. There we go. Let's place that down on the ground. And just to make sure that we're actually on the ground, let's get the camera out. And uh, that's more or less accurate. Okay. And then we'll do I don't know, this one, just another random one. Before we out, let's move this down. I do a lot of talking when I'm moving things around, so I apologize. If it's all redundant, it's that's just what I do. I don't need recognition for it. I just do what I please. That is not where I need it. More like that area. There we go. Let's increase the size a bit. And let's go back to our main camera. And uh, we might need to... To be able to see what we're doing here, we might have to chance it with the VFB. So let's let's chance it with the VFB, I guess. And remember, we might not even be keeping the camera in this location. We might be moving it to a little bit more advantageous location. Maybe one where we see more of the rock and the hill together. So we do have some rock in this, but we might need more of that rock. So we have it more chunky over here in the side on the left than we do on the right. So on and so forth, just trying to balance it all out. Um, this one needs to be moved up and back this way a bit, maybe about right there and down. Right there. I think that's where I need that one. All right, so this one's blocking that area. This one's blocking that area better. Okay. So, yes. That is, that's looking good. All right. So we'll keep this as our main shot for now. So we're going to just rename this camera to main. And let's turn these off and let's use our second camera to kind of look around and see where we can find maybe another good shot. I want to look up the hill, but don't, uh, don't 
be afraid to look down the hill. The only problem with that is that you see the horizon a lot more and that will be harder to cover up. Uh, so uh, just keep that in mind. You could probably look down the hill as long as you can find a good way to cover up the horizon. I actually think that we're probably in one of the better spots. Maybe we can go right here and then look that way. So we know that that other camera is in the right location. Let's just move the figure back this way so we can get it lined up properly. We'll go right here, right on the edge. There we go. back maybe about right here maybe we can try that one and uh, we'll just do this one name these main name one these will be using the main camera let's copy these and we'll call this one second and second one, eh, that's funny. Uh, and then we'll just move in the distribution. We'll just change the camera from main to second so that they distribute based on that camera cone instead. There we go. And now we'll just turn these on. And now that should populate that way. There we go, that works. Let's go ahead and save. And I do this a lot with a lot of my projects. I will have multiple cameras and multiple scatters, and I'll just turn the scatters on and off depending on what camera location I'm at. Um, and even in some cases, I'll have cameras set up in a specific area and then have the camera uh, or have a scatter for surface spread attached to that camera for the distribution, looking in another area, but not using that camera as the main camera but only to get specific plants or rocks or other things that I need scattered in a location that I can't do from the main camera. So that's a good way to do things too. You don't always have to use your main camera for your main distribution. You can use secondary, tertiary cameras or whatever it is, however, however many cameras you want, infinite, literally, um, to scatter objects around in your scene in specific areas based on its cone and not use any of those as your main. They'll all be activated as long as you have the surface spread activated. It doesn't matter if your camera is the main camera being used for render or not. So keep that in mind too. Let's start the VFB here and let's see if we have a good mixture of rock and grass and hill. I think this is a good location as well. Um, one thing that I forgot to do is enable the depth, uh, depth of field for my camera, um, but I will change that here shortly. I also need to change the ISO, it's at 100, I need to change that to 50 because I know that it's gonna be a little bit too bright with the f-stop that I wanna to go to. Um, in this location, we do need to have another plant for right here, but over here, we're probably totally fine. So, um, and the rocks themselves, we do have quite a bit, or you can see the big rock chunk here, which is actually kinda of cool. Um, but I am gonna put in another plant right here. If you wanted to bring in another texture for your ground, you could, or you can just use another bump uh, for your for your ground and just bring in some artificial detail. I'm just going to cover it up with a plant. So uh, let's do that real quick. I'm going to use this one this time. I'm doing control and I'm clicking and dragging out and that's allowing me to uh, make copies, just so you know. I'm going to copy this camera. I'm going to call this one free cam. The free cam will be one that I don't use for anything. Uh, no, no surface spreads or anything, and it's just used specifically for this kind of work. I do a lot of that too. So that's kind of like my my workflow is is that. I just have a bunch of cameras and. One of them is a free cam and does what it wants. Uh, 
Why did it not move? There we go. And there we go. Um, I'm not entirely sure of a good way to do a lot of this stuff. I just kind of have been doing it this way for a long time. It might not be the best way, but if you guys have another way of moving objects around to specific locations a lot easier and dropping them down on top of another object, kind of like in Vue, please let me know. Um, I'm all down for that info. Trust me. Okay, so now we're going to have to enable the VFB here. So let's get these going. I'm going to save it. Start that up and let's move this plant into the location we need it to be. I think at this camera angle as well, it looks a little bit better because uh, uh, for one other reason is I can actually see the fractal breakup of that thatch grass a lot easier. And I think that alone looks really cool. All right, let's uh, increase the size of this bad boy just a bit. And let's put her down into where we need it. Let me go back this way and over. And I think about right there. Let's increase the size more. We'll just use the scale to our advantage. Be able to scale it up and hide that spot. There we go. Let's let that render out to all five passes. Um, and then at this point, I think we're going to play with the lighting because that right there, I think, looks uh, looks passable. I would say it looks passable. There are areas in Utah where we have a bunch of like rabbit brush where when you're walking through it, it's like tick heaven uh, and spider heaven and looks just like this. We have a bunch of sagebrush and like that thatch grass. Um, looks exactly like this thatch grass, just all over the place and huge swaths of it. So, um, yeah, I think in this specific situation, this this is looking a lot like around where I live. In the background, you might see some rocky mountains a bit with some snow caps. Um, you can put those in if you would like. Uh, you, really, it's your scene. You can do whatever you want. But in this case, I'm just doing the hill. All right, so let's play with the sun a bit more. I'm going to bring it down to 10 degrees at this point. That'll give us this nice little sunset look, which everybody likes to have in their renders. Um, be a little bit creative with it, I suppose. You could do like a nice bright daylight um, uh, during like early afternoon or maybe late afternoon. Uh, just be creative with it. You don't always have to do a sunset, but I know a lot of people find those a lot more appealing when they're looking at thumbnails and whatnot. So I just stick with that and call it good. Now let's find a good rotation for the sun till we find one that looks more or less like what we want. And the sun coming from that direction gives us some good shadows on the plants and it really shows off the, the plant's translucency. So that might, that might be good. Um, the sun is a tad bit too bright. I, I do like nice intense suns, uh, especially sunlight, but I, this is such a mellow scene. I don't think we need such bright light. Uh, that will reduce the effect of the translucency on the plants a little bit, but that's totally fine because there's plenty of that to, to spare. And, uh, Let's play with the sky object real quick and enable the volume effect. That should help get us a little bit of distance in this. Not that we need it. It's not very big. It's only 100 meters. Um, but uh, we, we could always add a little bit just to help. I'm going to really increase it a lot here. 100 is too much. Let's do 25. 25 is good. Now we're starting to get it in this back area right there. So let's see the before 
and the after. The after adds just a little bit there. We don't have too much. Um, the altitude is important. You can choose the altitude you want it to be at. My location is about there. I just kind of eyeballed it. Turbidity is totally subjective based on whatever you want your scene to look like. It's going to be more of a hazy, overcast day. Maybe there's a lot of pollution or a lot of clouds in the sky. Increase the turbidity. If there's not a lot, uh, just decrease it, uh, making it more of a clear day. That will make will impact your volume effect, though, so you got to keep that in mind. I'm going to actually go between a good clear day and more of a slight hazy day. Maybe there's rain on the horizon here. The intensity here is going to change how bright our sky is object here is, um, as well as our global illumination. It will brighten up our scene quite a bit, so small steps in this specific area is important, so maybe 1.5. Just want it to be a little bit brighter, but not so bright that it's blowing out the sun, like right here in the corner. Uh, just enough to bring in a little bit more of that blue sky hue in our shadows for the global illumination. And uh, for the sun, let's actually change the rotation a bit more. Let's let's go back to zero and see where standard is. Uh, and then we'll just slowly increase it. I think right there might be better. 108. Maybe one. I'm a sucker for like nice values that are not weird that nobody would use. <laughs> it's 108 and it makes me want to go to 110, but I want it to be probably a little bit further than that. So 125 looks quite all right right here. Okay, so um, the sun here, uh, the sun size, this will change how soft or sharp the shadows are, but it will also change it in the sky too. Uh, I think 1.5 for this specific scene is probably going to be fine. That will give us slightly softer shadows, um, but not so soft that we lose a lot of detail on the top parts of those shadows at the, the longest stretch of them. Uh, and you can see that like right here. If you hear my heater go off in the background, I apologize. It gets cold in my basement uh, or in my computer room in general, like during this time of the year. So I have a portable heater in here and it goes off automatically. So, all right, now I think that's good. Now you can do a couple things here. You can either set up clouds through whatever your program's volume loader is, your VDB loader is, or like a volume material applied to a some object that you modeled, um, or you can import an HDRI. I'm going to go ahead and import an HDRI. So before I do that, I'm going to save. And now I'm just going to make another Corona Sky, and I will call this HDR. Uh, important though is we don't want visible by global illumination or GI. I only want it visible uh, directly. So it only really appears in the sky. If you had some reflections like water or glass or anything that was reflective or refractive, you want to keep these two things on right here. But I don't necessarily want the HDRI to cast lighting and shadows. So I turn it off visible by GI. That way we don't get that weird mixed like uh, the the sun object I have as well as a sky object I have or the HDRI, they don't conflict with each other. So I just turn off visible by GI and keep visible directly enabled. Um, and we're going, we are going to change this to HDRI. And now um, we need to find what we want to use. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up my 3D models folder. Hopefully it will open. There we go. And uh, I'll go back one. That's where I keep my HDRIs. I have a bunch of them. I have a bunch of my own. But this one, I'm going to use a Skypack HDRI. So let's see what we have available to us. I like a lot of the ones in 20. They have some really cool looking 
HD rise. All right, so since this sun is probably like late afternoon, probably around the time when evening starts, it's a little lower in the atmosphere. We're getting some color shift from the horizon. Um, things are becoming a little bit more warm and golden hour. So let's find one kind of like that or like that might do. Um, one that doesn't have a whole bunch of like pink clouds in the sky. This one right here, 416, 417, 419 might do. Okay, so um, I think the one I like is 422. So let's go ahead and use that one. Right there. Let's go ahead and load that up. Give that a minute. The sun is off to the side over here. So we got to make sure we rotate it accordingly. Um, I'm going to turn off this sky for now so I can see this one. It's really dark. So uh, the intensity we can increase um, like three. There we go. And we can also increase the brightness here in the exposure. Let's increase that three. There we go. Now let's go back and make sure we get the suns to line up properly. So we got to find the sun in this image. There it is. That was easy. We got to go back this way. So about right there is where it's at. And that gives us a good look for the clouds that's going on in the back. Um, we just got to change the offset on the V here until we get the horizon blocked. There we go. We don't want much of whatever the image holds for the horizon there. We just want the clouds. Now we can re-enable this. There we go. And now we have clouds in there. And uh, they're a little bit blown out with this sun, but or for this sky object, but I think we can reduce this to something like 0.7. There we go. And we're still going to get a good amount of GI coming in through that. But I think this right here looks a little bit better. Um, and with that said, we could also reduce this to like two. So it's still a little blown out. There we go. All right. I think that right there is looking good. Now, because we reduce the intensity of this physical sky, um, the PRG clear sky model works in a very interesting way. If you reduce the intensity here, it's also going to reduce the volume effect here. Um, so we need to increase it here to kind of compensate. So we get a little bit more of that fog fall off towards the tops there. I don't need a whole lot because it's not a big scene, um, but I think 50 might work well. And what we're going to do is we're also going to change the fake horizon blur. We'll go to 0.5 for now, and then you can see what that's doing here. We're getting this, this color on the horizons to help blend that horizon blur. We can use a color more akin to what we have for our sun color in the in the, uh, the HDRI, and I think that right there might do well enough. Okay, um, I don't think there's anything else that I really need to set up here. Maybe we can reduce the intensity here again to two. Those plants are really bright. Um, and you actually know what? I actually quite liked how bright they were at three. Let's go to four. Let's live a little. That sun is super bright still, so we don't want it to be dull in the sky, or bright in the sky, but dull on the ground. We want the ground to be well lit too. And I think increasing it from three to four, four was probably the right choice. Okay, so um, this is going on really long, but it's been a good breakdown. Let's do a quick render real quick at a small resolution, just so you can, guys can see it. I'm going to set up the Corona render to do Corona high quality denoising. We're going to do 15 passes. This is just the test. And we're going to do an output of, uh, we'll do a, 
1080. There we go. 1080p. And let's save it. And let's give it a good render. Oh, no, hold on. We have to change the camera here. So um, I want to enable the depth of field. So you see I'm using the f-stop of 2.8. I'm going to reduce this. So I know I got to reduce the, the, the ISO here, but I'm going to reduce this to 1.8. This will make it brighter. You'll see in the VFB once it updates, uh, if it updates. And we also need, there it goes. Um, we also need to enable the depth of field. Uh, the grass disappears every once in a while when I make changes, that's okay. Uh, we'll reduce the ISO to 50, that should resolve that. And now, the focus distance, we will focus probably on this plant right here. Which is that one. And uh, we'll call it good, because that'll give us a good focus, like mid-ground focus. That's why I chose that one. I mean, I didn't choose it for any specific reason other than that. So uh, we'll do the focus object there, which will update the distance here, which is uh, 25.743 meters. And it locks it out so I can't change it. Okay, so now we will get a good amount of depth of field. It, it won't be too strong, but it'll be noticeable. Uh, and now our lighting's back to where it needs to be. So let's go ahead and save it again and now we will do a render yep let's go ahead and stop it and go and then you can kind of see how fast corona render really is despite being a cpu rendering engine um it's it's still not nearly as fast as octane or maybe redshift or maybe even v-ray um but in my opinion having used all of those render engines and some of them for a very long time at this point in my life uh, well over a decade corona render handles large amounts of displacement and geometry extremely well and renders out these images with that geometry and that displacement extremely quick and i did a test with corona against octane on a scene scattered with literally hundreds of millions of objects and it took longer for octane to start up after calculating the the scatters and the displacement than it did for corona to calculate it and start rendering it and by the time that <clears throat> um octane had finished uh calculating everything it needed for that image it was a 4k image um Corona had already gone through like three or four passes, which uh, for that scene, essentially the scene was done. So um, it definitely handles things a lot better with larger chunks of data, which is understandable because GPU rendering engines, despite being extremely fast and awesome, and I love them to death, suffer from... Uh, the ability to scale properly when it comes to having a lot of scatters uh, or a lot of objects i guess high poly objects at that with high resolution textures because you have such limited uh, memory all right so what we're looking for here is we're looking to see how well the grass looks it's looking good even with that depth of field we're looking to see if we have any areas that we might want to change uh, maybe this area right here because i can see the ground that small area right there actually doesn't bother me too much, uh, so I'm not going to care about that. We're looking at the rocks, making sure that the rocks don't look too out of place. And they're not really looking out of place. They are dark, though, so I might have to go back into the material for those and just lighten them up a bit, which will be super easy. And then we're also looking to see if we can notice the fractal breakup of that secondary grass which we do see here we can see the fractal breakup appearing everywhere um, which is good so that gives us a good amount of variation and then we're just seeing if the overall size and scale of the scene is good the lighting's good um, so on and so forth so that is the breakdown of how i would go about making a scene like this as a very long video i know a lot of you might not watch the full thing but at least you can see how I go about doing things myself. 
and results tend to be pretty good. I mean, they're not necessarily terrible. So, <clears throat> lots of talking. You had to hear my annoying voice the entire time. I apologize for that. You have to hear all my ums and all my thinking times and clearing my throat all the time. That's because I, when I talk for a long time, my nose starts hurting and my throat starts hurting and I'm going to wake up feeling like I have a sore throat in the morning, but it's okay. It's worth it. As long as you guys are learning, it's okay. I have a drink here, but it's not helping because it's not water. It's soda. Soda is the worst thing to quench your thirst and wet your mouth with because <clears throat> it's sugary. It makes it sticky when your mouth gets dry. It's nasty. All right. So two things I'm going to change in this scene. One, it's going to be the raw color. I'm going to make that less dark, make it a little bit more bright um, and light so it's, so it's not as dark. Uh, just a little bit, though, not too much. And um, I'm going to move the sun in the HDRI over to this way just a tad bit more, but also not much, just a little bit. And then I'm going to increase the distance fog in that PRG sky just slightly more. I think we're at 50 right now. I'm probably going to go up to 65. So uh, let's cancel that. Uh, and right here, we're already at four passes. And so that is about, how long was that? Four minutes uh, for it to get the four passes. So that's about one minute a pass, a little bit, a little over one minute, which is fine because uh, scenes like this will clear up really quick. But to go back to Octane versus Corona real quick, um, that was a five minute build time for Corona before it started rendering. It was like a 25 minute build time for Octane. Once Octane built it, it rendered out really quick, like no joke. It was like it, it built and then it got through all the samples I had set up for it, its max sample limit um, uh, within maybe four, I would say, I would say maybe between four to eight minutes. I can't really remember, but I knew it. I know it wasn't like instantaneous. It was really quick though. So even though it took Corona render about 20 minutes to finish, it took about 25 minutes or about 25 minutes for Corona render to finish. It took about 20, 20, 20 to 25 minutes for Octane to do the displacement, set up all the geometry and then render, but it did render faster, but it came out to be almost sixes. The quality of the images were about the same. I think Corona had uh, less noise than Octane. I wish I had these images. I don't have them anymore. Um, Corona had less noise, but Octane rendered out faster, and I could have added more samples to clear up the noise a bit, or I could have used some Firefly um, reduction or whatever, or some denoiser, which I didn't use. Um, I didn't use denoiser on either of them, so Corona had less noise naturally, I guess, uh, than Octane, but I mean, both of them worked really well. Anyways, tangent over. Let's add uh, 65 here. Let's take this and move it. Uh, I might have to do this. Yes, I want to stop it. Because I can't remember which way I cut kind of rotate it. I am really bad at memorizing which way I have to go on the offsets to go left or right. And um, I'm so tired right now that even if I dedicated it to memory, going to sleep and then waking up so soon after doing this video or clicking stop on the record button will just not help me dedicate it to memory. So I'm just going to do a quick VFB here. Could have turned those off to make it quicker. And we're just going to increase it. Nope, we got to decrease it. That was too far. I think I just wanted to go to 10. Yeah, I think 10 is where I wanted to go. Maybe 12. <clears throat> 12 is good. I'm going to go to 12. Um, and I increased the distance fog to 65. It didn't look like it added too much, but that's OK. Like I said before, we don't need too much there. Um, let's save this and let's
let's go into our rock, which is the default one. And we're just going to color correct this to be a little bit more bright, which we already did once before. Let's go to point three on the brightness. There we go. I think that might do it. Let's save that. We're still using the fusion here, right? Yes. So that's the texture we made in Gaia. And that's our rock material being applied by our yeah, okay. So I reduce the, I increase the brightness on them. I think that looks a little bit better. They're not as dark. Um, and they, I think they look a little better. So yeah, they're not nearly as dark. Okay, I think that's good. Um, I'm gonna do a full render here overnight while I sleep. And uh, you guys will see it at the end of this video most likely. I just got to edit the video, put everything in, and then call it good, and then we'll be done. Uh, actually, real quick, I think they're a little bit too bright now, so let's go to point six and maybe point two there. They were just maybe a tad bit too bright now, but again, small, small changes. All right, uh, let's do a 4K render. So this will be 2160. By 3840 and for Corona I'm gonna increase the samples to 100 it'll probably probably be done by the time I get up in the morning make sure the GI solvers path tracing because the UHD cache will not help us in this situation we are outside the denoise amount will keep at the defaults here we're not going to change anything there for the performance settings we want to change the GIAA balance a bit because we are using some depth of field. If we reduce this um, to like eight, it will sample the depth of field more before it samples the anti-aliasing. Um, so the depth of field will actually resolve a little bit quicker than the anti-aliasing, but that's fine. I'm only reducing it a little bit, I'm not reducing it a whole lot. The max sample intensity um, I'm going to increase to uh, we're not going to need a whole lot here because we're outside. Um, but if we wanted to have a more accurate um, result, we can increase this to something like 200. That'll give us more accuracy in our shadows and our global illumination, things like that. Uh, it will increase render times, but not by much. The ray depth, we don't have any specularity going on here. We don't have any refractions, no reflections. We can reduce these to something like five, and that should save us some time there as well. So uh, overall, we're not really changing a whole lot here. We're just uh, optimizing things to the best of our ability. All right. Corona, what I like about Corona is that it's all like super easy to set up. There's not a lot of complicated render send settings, at least not yet. I mean, I'm pretty sure that will change. Uh, but not yet. So it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's it's pretty much just push a button and go. I love it. Um, I'm also going to change, I know I didn't say this before, but I'm going to change the, um, the sun rotation a bit more to maybe 133. And we're also going to change the angle down to maybe 8 or 7, depending on where these shadows start coming in. I want more shadows in the grass is what I'm going for. Shadows up here, and then shadows coming across the grass. The, uh, for this, we might have to increase the intensity of, again as well, maybe to five, maybe six. I know it seems weird, like as the sun goes down, it would not get as bright, but during that golden hour, the sun is actually really bright, especially on vegetation. So uh, when you're going down in altitude, if you want to have a nice, natural, naturally lit render, maybe increasing the sun intensity more than you normally would past the defaults or past your normal settings 
might help you out a little bit because it's going to introduce light in a way that it would naturally because that when that golden hour comes up um, the sun is super bright on the horizon and that's why you get the nice golden hour look it's not because light's going away it's because light's being introduced and it doesn't last very long and then it eventually goes away so uh, i increase it just a little bit more on the uh, in the scene and then we get something a little bit more like this rather than downplayed and not uh, lit very well so all right let's save that again and now we will do the actual final render um and i will see you guys in the morning there will be no more further explanation this render and build is done so after i'm done talking here and hit that stop button you will see the final render and then we're done uh so sign off here thank you guys for watching i know this was a long video it's almost three hours long it's, it's as long as sitting down and watching a freaking movie two hours and 30 minutes i mean it's not the first time i've done this for videos, I've had long videos. I've had a six hour long live stream for crying out loud. And then I had like another four hour one after that. Um, and a lot of my older videos were upwards like this, but this was a full build breakdown of how I would make a scene like this and my thinking behind it and some, hopefully you learn some techniques on what to do for any future builds that you guys might be doing. Um, and I hope you guys learned something. If you appreciate videos like this, let me know in the video or in the comments section below. I try to keep videos short so people's attention spans can be stuck to the video rather than somewhere else. Um, that's becoming increasingly more difficult with younger generations coming in. I'm not saying that to be rude, but it's true. When I first started YouTube, it was a bunch of old people and those people would watch the entire video and then leave long lengthy comments on what they liked what they want to see improved or what they want to be talked about next. And it was great because it gave me content, but now I don't get a lot of that. And people's uh, watch retention is like in the first four minutes they watch, they're gone. Um, and that's on the majority of my videos. They might hit like um, a lot of the time because they might like the content normally, but they just don't watch it. Um, but truly uh, guys leave comments watch the full thing it helps uh, especially in youtube nowadays it's really becoming difficult to continually justify putting videos on youtube uh, because youtube is making it really hard for small creators like myself and i'm not saying that just to complain or join that bandwagon it's very true um, and i'm looking for other ways to get a hold of you guys and make content for you guys so i actually joined locals i will be putting a link to my all of my content and a link tree link in the description you can find the discord you can find um uh, my art station my gumroad my locals profile that i'm creating um and i will also be trying to post more videos on locals and i will probably be moving that to where gumroad's more like a store and i'm going to be moving everything else to locals for more of like a patreon kind of thing if you guys want to help uh fund these kind of videos and projects that would be helpful because it's going to be coming it's going to get a lot harder in the future for me to continue making videos for you guys and i would love to continue helping you guys learn with new programs um houdini, houdini's coming um and uh world creators coming so those are the two things that i chose i'm going to talk about next mostly i'm also making adjustments to almmc if you guys don't know what that is i have videos on that that'll be updated for 4.27 um and also a unreal engine 5 option as soon as i'm able and allowed to do it so all those updates are there sorry signing off now thank you guys for watching i'll see you in the next video